in the interest of time, we'll get started. For those I haven't met, I'm Nikki Schmidt. I'm a um, head and neck surgeon scientist here at Winship. Uh, thanks for joining us for Winship Grand Rounds this morning. If you're an Emory University or healthcare employee and would like to receive a CME credit for attending today, today's access code is 496222. Can also be found in the chat feature at the bottom of the screen for virtual attendees. If you have any issues with this webinar or CME login, uh, please send Katia to Fafana an email or drop a note via the chat feature. Um, this morning is my um, privilege to introduce uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Zach Buckwald, uh, who will be our speaker this morning. Um, Dr. Buckwald um, was quite stubborn about getting all of his education in St. Louis, uh, where he was an undergrad at WashU and then did his MD and PhD in immunology at St. Louis University. Um, along the way, he's uh, really focused on uh, com combining immunotherapy and radiation and the role of the tumor draining lymph node. Uh, he then finished uh, radiation oncology residency here at Emory and then stayed on faculty where he's now an assistant professor um, and um, cert, uh, uh, clinician scientist here. Um, so he focuses primarily on cutaneous malignancies and he's gonna be talking to us today. Um, his title is Using in Situ Vaccination to Enhance the Anti-Tumor CD8 T cell Response. Thanks. Well, thank you. You guys, can you hear me okay? So thank you so much for the very nice introduction, uh, Dr. Schmidt. So um, she already read the title, so I won't rehash it. But basically, um, you know, I'm a radiation oncologist, so we use radiation to, um, to kill cancer and to also potentially stimulate the immune response. I use the title in situ vaccination because that's how I think of radiation, not as radiation in the classical sense, but as a vaccine to actually stimulate um, T cells. So um, I'm going to talk about three sort of vignettes in the uh, in the presentation today. The first will be entirely human data from a clinical trial that we um, we recently completed at Emory and is under final revision uh, in uh, in in manuscript form. Uh, hopefully, it will be published in the next few months. The second um, is a manuscript that will be submitted in the near future and is all mouse data and sort of more mechanistic. And then the third. Um, I've talked about this a little bit. It's all sort of retrospective and um, and uh, human analyses with a potential clinical trial that we are trying to get off the ground. So um, let's focus on the first one first. So um, the 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 topic is brain metastases. I have talked a little bit about melanoma brain metastases because that's what I treat a lot of. But the data I'm going to be showing is a potpourri of different metastases the plurality or even the majority of which are actually non-small cell lung cancer. So we know brain metastases are a unfortunate cause of death in melanoma patients. A very high proportion of metastatic melanoma patients will develop brain mets and eventually succumb to their disease. We manage brain mets in a variety of different ways. Melanoma is a little bit unusual because we can actually manage brain metastases in the upfront setting with immunotherapy. But classically, uh, at least symptomatic brain metastases are treated with a combination of radiation and surgery. Surgery if the patients have the uh, performance status to actually undergo it. So if the patients get surgery, the classical way to do it was that they would get surgery for that le dominant lesion and they would get radiation afterwards. Um, we and a couple of other centers uh, started a clinical trial where we moved the radiation to the upfront setting where we gave preoperative SRS waited a period of time, then they went to surgery. And the reason this was advantageous is because that neoadjuvant approach allowed us to interrogate the impact of radiation on the immune response in the brain mets. Um, and the combination therapy actually leads to better local control for larger mets than either one alone. So now a little bit more background. Um, if you've heard me speak before, you know I, I did my postdoctoral fellowship in Rafi Ahmed's lab. And, and just prior to my arrival, they'd made a number of different uh, interesting discoveries about subsets of CD8 T cells under the under the uh, conditions of chronic viral infection or cancer. And what they found is that if you look at a population of antigen experienced PD-1 positive T cells, they're not monolithic. There are, or sort of, they sit on a spectrum of um, proliferative capacity as well as effector potential. And so it, at one end of the spectrum, there is a stem-like or progenitor subset, which expresses a transcription factor called TCF1. That, that cell has the capacities for self-renewal. 
expansion following stimulus with anti-PD-1, and then differentiation into this other subset, a terminally differentiated effector cell, which actually has the capacity to kill cancer cells. And so that, that was sort of the milieu um, that was, that was uh, germinating in, the doc, in Dr. Ahmed's lab when I joined uh, a few years back. And then uh, my collaborator for this section of the talk, the Hayden Kissick, published a very nice paper in Nature now four years ago with lead author Kerry Jansen that showed um, that these stem-like cells in renal cell cancer um, reside in these immunologic sort of microenvironments within the cancer called, they called immune niches. And these microenvironments are comprised of both these stem-like T cells and antigen presenting cells in close apposition or approximation. So, um, you know, we 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 set out on this on the journey of this project in close collaboration with the Kissick Lab. I we started this actually before I even had my own lab, and then we moved it forward. and And Carrie Jansen, uh, MD PhD student, has really um, helped lead the way with a lot of this work. So we asked a, a couple of initial questions in the first part of these of this study, which we started way back in almost 2018 now. So the first was, are these stem-like cells present in brain metastases? Um, is there, uh, are these niches present in brain metastases? And they had shown in renal cell that the density of these niches, higher, higher immune niche density, was associated with better patient outcomes. So we wanted to see whether there was also a correlation between niche density and brain mets and patient outcomes. And then finally, the radiation aspect of things, what impact does SRS have on this subset of T cells, the immune niche and, and patient outcomes? So um, we started off by just doing uh, seven color immunofluorescence. And we, on the left here, you can see a brain met with the outline of the, uh, the, the pathologist outlined the area of, of interest, the, the, the disease itself. And then you can see the different colors we use to stain different things. And so basically this is just showing a region of interest with um, sort of an immune cluster here um, with a variety of different stains. And then if we zoom in further, we have red ar arrows, um, the sort of the red halo represents a CD8 T cell. The red arrow represents a effector T cell with no nuclear staining for TCF1. And then the green arrow shows the stem-like cells which stain both for CD8 and uh, TCF1. And we also have looked to show that these, that by IF and by flow, these are about, of the TCF1 positive cells, there's about, they're about 70 to 80% PD-1 positive. So very, very small proportion of them are actually naive cells. They're mostly the stem-like population. We validated these findings by flow cytometry and just showing some markers here that the, by flow, the stem-like population expresses TCF1, whereas the terminally differentiated effectors do not. Another marker is HIM3 for the effector cells. They're expressed by the terminally differentiated cells and not by the stems, and, and then a number of other markers. So next, we, um, we then went on and asked, um, uh, we, we know that there's these stem-like cells, or at least cells that have that phenotype in brain metastases. We wanted to know sort of their geographic uh, di distribution within within the brain met. So we we performed an assay that the uh, using this algorithm um, that that the uh, Kissick lab had developed to sort of create a topographic map of the density of antigen presenting cells, which are shown in sort of these gray uh, wispy lines, and then asking um, when you have that map, that density map, are these stem-like cells found at um, higher density close to the antigen presenting cells versus further away. And if you quantify that, you show that the stem-like cells uh, are generally found much closer to the antigen presenting cells than the effector cells, sort of uh, quanti quantitatively showing that this immune niche uh, or this, this phenomenon exists in brain metastases. And here's just another way of showing it. We show here an example of an immune niche where you have um, the antigen presenting cells in close proximity to, to a stem-like T cell. And then if you if you look here at this correlation, what we're what we're what this is showing is that when you have an increase in the frequency of CD8 cells, um, you also have an increase in the proportion of the immune niche. And, and so what what that suggests is that, um, and this was sort of argued in that nature paper, is that the immune niche is the presence of the immune niche is important for maintaining the T cell response in the brain met. So if you have, if the immune niche doesn't exist or, or regresses in some way, then the CD8 T cell response is, is thought to sort of not 
not persist or, or collapse. Um, so we then next, we next asked, um, is there a uh, correlation between the density of the immune niche and patient outcome? And so we looked at um, all of our patients in this cohort, which was about 70 patients, 67, 70 patients. And we said, well, there's a high uh, proportion, there are patients with a high niche infiltration. This is a cystic brain met here, which was resected. And then um, nine, up to nine years or 10 years later, there was no evidence of a local recurrence at that site. And here is a quantitation or a or sort of a topographic map of the immune niche in this brain met. And then if you look in contrast at another cystic brain met with a poorly infiltrated niche, again, you see, um, a cystic brain met, it's resected, but um, six months later, you already have a nodular recurrence at the at the uh, at that site, and you can see here there was you know very limited immune niche infiltration, and we did a competing risk analysis, which allows us to really control for death because you know death would obviously be a competing risk with local recurrence, and what you see is that um, a higher density of stem-like T cells or a higher proportion of stem-like T cells and a higher proportion of immune niche in these brain mets um, is associated with improved local control. And we selected local control because it's subjected to the least confounding. If you pick uh, survival, if you pick progression-free survival outside the brain or distant, those can be impacted by a lot of different things. Local therapy is really impacted by the surgery, the radiation, and then whatever else intrinsic factors are going on in the tumor. Okay, so moving on to uh, radiation. So we thought those findings were interesting, but next we wanted to really ask the question, what impact? Did you want to ask a question? Now? I, I, sure. Yeah, went on. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so great, great question, Dr. Lawson. It's certainly a question a lot of reviewers were asked. The question was, uh, how much steroids, uh, what was the dose of steroids? So these patients were almost all universally on a very high dose. The standard dose that they're put on preoperatively is 4Q6. Most of these patients have neurologic symptoms, so they're put on that dose. Data I'm not going to show you, but in this clinical trial, we actually randomized patients, or not, we, we alternatingly allocated patients to high or low dose dexamethasone to interrogate that question. In the preliminary data that we have, which again, I'm not going to show you today, um, there is no statistically significant difference between less than four milligrams of dexa dexamethasone and greater than 16 milligrams a day. Um, in the in the immune niche or the T cell population. Doesn't mean it's not impacting it, but most of the time they're on it for a relatively short period of time. And so I think that probably enters into it. And of course, there is some variability in the human population, but, but that's the data we have right now. Um, so moving on to radiation. So radiation we know can act as an immunomodulator. This is work that's been done by a lot of different groups, spearheaded in part by Silvio Fermenti. And there's still a lot of controversy out there whether um, and, and skepticism about whether radiation can really synergize with immunotherapy in the clinical setting. The data preclinically is, is, is unequivocal at this point, but actually translating that to the clinical setting remains a challenge. So what, what this basically is showing in this review from uh, New England Journal is that radiation kills cancer cells in, immunogenic, in, a, in an immunogenic fashion. It releases antigen and endogenous immunostimulatory agents called DAMPs which can activate antigen presenting cells, which stimulate T cells, and then those T cells can go on and kill the cancer. Now, um, we wanted to really look at how, uh, what, what was happening in, in the brain immune microenvironment. And so, as I said, we started this clinical trial where we gave preoperative SRS, and then the patients went to surgery at various time points following radiation. The, um, what I, the data I'm gonna show you was a composite of that clinical trial and some retrospective samples that we received from an outside institution that had been routinely doing preoperative SRS off of study. So first we wanted to see whether in the preoperative SRS patients, there was uh, a stem-like and a terminal effector population. I'm not gonna show you all that data, but just by flow, you can see that that population was also in the preoperative SRS patients. There was still an immune niche there um, and by, by immunofluorescence. But um, just one data point of difference, there was a reduction. If you look at uh, the patients that went for upfront surgery on the left and got preoperative SRS on the right, there was a statistically significant reduction in the C8 T cell population. Yeah. 
So to dig into sort of this difference, we, we have a lot more data by IF, but just to dig into this difference for the sake, the sake of time, we performed single cell RNA sequencing. We've now done this on 20 patients that got upfront surgery and 20 patients that got preoperative SRS. Um, that data is not quite finished for our journal manuscript revision, but I'm just going to show you three and three right now. And so first off, we, we perform single cell, as I said, and we have, uh, we, we asked, can we define the the stem-like population I've talked about, the terminal effector population I've talked about, and then uh, a previously described transitory or, or intermediate population um, that has that has been uh, described in multiple publications previously. So here is the stem-like population in green, here is the terminally differentiated population in blue, and then here's this transitory population in yellow. And here are just some feature plots um, sort of defining those populations. If we look, um, and what I should say is this is all unirradiated patients. So this is unirradiated. If we look at the uh, pooled three patients that got radiation, what we see are some uh, notable differences, primarily, and I think it's obvious to the eye that there is a drop in the transitory population following radiation with some uh, drop in the stem-like population. If we quantify that in the three patients in each group, there does seem to be a consistent drop in the transitory population, although there are in this one patient here, had a lower transitory population at baseline. So, um, you know, this data seems to hold up with the larger cohort, although the data is still being analyzed and should be ready for prime time soon. Um, we wanted to sort of understand why we thought the transitory population was, was being preferentially reduced. And we, we, we knew from prior data that the transitory cells are actually more proliferative and radiation uh, cells that are proliferating are more sensitive to radiation. So we show here that, um, in our cohort, the transitory cells were more proliferative. So it's perhaps not surprising that they seem to be preferentially impacted by exposure to radiation. Now, um, we also looked at uh, clonotypic overlap between the different subsets. And um, we see that there is clonotypic overlap in the immunodominant clonotype as well as uh, subdominant clonotypes between the three subsets I described, stem, terminally differentiated, and transitory. Um, and one interesting observation is that it does seem like there is um, a, a greater representation of the immunodominant clonotype following radiation, um, and this overlaps with the stem-like population. Now, this interesting finding really does hold up uh, when we do it on a much larger cohort. I said about 20 patients, and the implications that we could discuss afterwards. But we, but one possibility is that. Um, you know, radiation is preferentially depleting subdominant clonotype. Alternatively, it could be that radiation stimulate an expansion of that clonotype, so it represents uh, it is overrepresented in the terminal effectors um, after treatment. So, um, you know, so far I've just talked about how radiation is potentially bad, right? It's getting rid of this subset of T cells, which we think has a role in in um, you know differentiating into the effector cell. So. I think that was a uh, kind of myo myopic or limited view. So we wanted to really understand um, how things change over time because, you know, after you stimulate with something, you need to look at different time points to really understand the, the changes. So we performed, um, you know, sort of a kinetic analysis looking at patients that got pre-op SRS and then went to surgery at different time points afterwards. And what we found was something interesting. We found sort of a U-shaped curve in the CAT cell density. Whereas early on, really there's not much change, and then you see a drop, but then a rebound at about six plus days following uh, radiation to the, the brain med. If, um, if you look at these subsets, what you see is that um, you kind of an interesting find. This is the stem-like population. You see a reduction in the frequency over time and an increase in the frequency of the terminal effectors over time. And so what, what are the implications of that? Well, one, it could be that you're sort of changing you know, how we're depleting different cells. I think based on our preclinical data, it suggests that radiation is actually stimulating uh, potential differentiation of the stem-like population into the terminal vectors, but that differentiation takes time and that repopulation takes time. That, that's a hip hypothesis we're interrogating preclinically. It's a little bit difficult to do in humans. So in conclusion for this part, what we've shown is that our, there are immune niches present in melanoma and other uh, histologic brain metastases. This density appears to be prognostic for local control. However, we obviously need additional validation. 
and that preoperative SRS reduces the T cell population as a whole. However, if you look at the kinetic analysis, uh, it seems like there is a, a regrowth or repopulation driven by an increase in the frequency of terminal effector cells. And so, yes. Yeah, great question. So um, the, the, the dose and fractionation on the retrospective cohort was pretty homogeneous. That was a, typically about 15. It was a preoperative dose, so it's a little bit different from a definitive dose. 15-ish gray in one fraction. On our clinical trial was more heterogeneous, and we've taken that into account in the larger analysis, but um, that ranged from one fraction to three fractions, typically from about 24 gray to 15 gray, something in that neighborhood. <laughs> No, and, and that's fair. I, um, so why do I think that? So first of all, that data I showed you from the single cell wasn't broken down by like a time course, right? That was, most of those were early and that's what we had at the time. We've subsequently looked and, and um, you know, again, it's very hard to do by single cell because no matter how much you spend, you're still limited in the number of samples. So um, I don't, the bottom line is I don't have a good, I don't have good data to support that hypothesis other than that's what kind of makes sense to me. But I agree with your point. The data I've shown you so far, the single cell data, that's, I can't really draw that conclusion from that. That's really drawn from the immunofluorescence data. The problem with the immunofluorescence data is that it's very hard to define this, the transitory subset by, by protein. It's usually a transcriptional signature. Mm, yeah. No, that's that's a really interesting hypothesis. Um, I think it. I mean, we could let's talk about that afterwards because I think that's a really interesting idea. So, uh, yes, Dr. Torres. Is this what you're seeing here? Is this something that you would similarly see in a wound injury? Like this, so to me, what you're seeing makes sense. I would expect there would be more differentiation in response to injury from radiation. Mm -hmm. Do you see that, like, when the, with a cut and somebody's been cut, or you know, who's received radiation to other parts of the body? Do you see this see this same phenomenon? Um, it's a it's an interesting question. It's a hard question to answer because in a wound, you wouldn't really see like chronic antigen exposure and sort of ex an exhausted T cell phenotype. So it's a little bit it's a little bit hard to draw an analogous connection. What you do see, what we do know is under any circumstances when radiation is given, you see an initial influx of regulatory T cells to counterbalance a more inflammatory response. So I would anticipate you would see some sort of differentiation, but that's counterbalanced by this regulatory T cell influx that happens in a lot of other sites. It doesn't seem to happen to this quite the same extent in the brain, probably because um, you know there, there are barriers to influx in the brain. But it's a good question. Yes. Do we know what's happening in the nodes? Yeah, yeah, so, so that's, that's the next part of the talk. Uh, I I specifically didn't really dig into that in the brain because there, as you know, there is some nodal drainage. I think, it, and it certainly does play a role. I'm not sure it plays quite as much of a role as outside the brain, um, but that's the next part of the talk. So, good question though. Um, so, what are the implications for this? So, I whether or not, however, we kind of interpret these data. Um, I still I still would argue that it suggests that if you're going to give the, the optimal synergy between radiation and immunotherapy, it probably does not occur right after radiation. You probably want to wait a few days to maybe even a week to allow for that rebound in T cells to occur, give PD-1, and then even let it incubate as long as you can clinically and then resect. You don't, certainly don't want to resect early on because you're really going to take the, the, the tumor out at the nadir of T cell infiltration, potentially compromising, uh, you know, the local control, but maybe even uh, dissemination within the brain. So that that's that's the initial kind of clinical uh, implication that that we've conceived of. So moving on to the role of the tumor draining lymph node. So this is all outside of the brain, and it's all preclinical. So um, there there is a lot of controversy and a lot of skepticism about radiation and immunotherapy syn synergy 
But um, I think preclinically, the models are, are pretty well established. And I think some of the reasons for this, um, this lack of synergy, uh, uh, this, this lack of observed synergy in humans is because of the way we're delivering radiation. So um, just a little background. We, this is really an incontrovertible fact. Radiation liberates antigen in an immunogenic context in either humans or in mice. So it spills antigen out. And it does this in a, a pro-inflammatory way. In, in mice, it's been, clinic, it's been shown extensively that radiation can have an action at a distance. It can stimulate T cells to kill the local tumor as well as distant tumors. And, um, and we've shown that if you screw up the tumor draining lymph node in a variety of different ways, this attenuates radiation's immunogenicity. So, um, and we've also shown, and others have shown this in preclinical models, that there is nice synergy between PD-1 and PDL1, and I, that has been shown in humans as well, just really not in the fractionated context. And then finally, in our previous study we published uh, now a number of years ago, going back to that stem-like population, we showed that that population of cells is primarily relegated to the draining lymph node. And then very elegant work from the Kissick lab and other groups have sort of expanded and really shown that there is a lineage relationship between the stem-like cells in the node and in the tumor and how that sort of system works. The bottom line is that the node seems to be a reservoir for that stem-like population, which we know is important for a PD-1 response. We hypothesize that this stem-like population is also in the node, is also critically important for the radiation-stimulated immune response. And so how did we test this? Uh, we used the model that was originally developed in uh, Dr. Ahmed's lab and the cell line that was developed in his lab. And basically it's a standard B16 F10 cell line with a viral glycoprotein inserted into it, which is somewhat artificial, but allows us to track uh, tumor specific T, T cells um, very effectively. We put two, two tumors on here sequentially and we irradiate one, and then we give P PD-1 or PDL one in this case and track tumor growth. And so we and others have shown here that there is a nice synergy at the local tumor, tumor one. So that tumor one is always the irradiated site. Tumor two is always the unirradiated site. So um, what we see here is that when you give combination therapy, you have a reduction in tumor local control, uh, tumor growth locally as well as distantly. If you look at the, this is gated on CD8 T cells. If you look at the antigen specific CD8 T cells, you see that there is an increase in the number of uh, uh, tumor-specific T cells in both the irradiated tumor and the unirradiated tumor in the combination therapy group. And now the red uh, throughout this is the combination therapy group. So if you just kind of focus on that, that's where most of the, uh, the, the meat of the data is. So we next looked at the subsets of T cells, right? So we have the stem-like population down here and we have the terminal effector population up here. And then we have the different groups quantified here. And what we showed is that Combination therapy of radiation and PD-1 also increases the number of both the stem-like T cells and the terminal effector cells in the irradiated and the unirradiated tumor. So that's, that's interesting. That's what we're seeing in the tumor, but what about the lymph node? So as I said earlier, when we looked at the tumor-specific T cell population in both the lymph node and the tumor, we found that most of the T cells in the lymph node are stem-like whereas most of the T cells in the tumor were, uh, were terminal effectors, and it's quantified here. So um, you know, prior data suggested that the lymph node then is important for supplying the tumor with this stem-like population. So we wanted to ask, what role does the lymph node have in this synergy between radiation and immunotherapy? So to do that, we used a drug which blocks uh, lymph node egress of T cells called FTY720. And we performed the same experiments. All the rest of the data is really going to be showing radiation plus PD-1, not the other subgroups. We've done all of them, but just for uh, you know clarity, it's very difficult to show you know a, a, a billion different groups here. So here's the control plus PD-1 with no FTY720. Here's the control and RT plus PD-1 with uh, with the FT1, uh, FTY720 in place. And what we show is that you know, combination therapy increases T cells, antigen specific T cells in the tumor. But if you block the ability of the T cells to get out of the node, that um, that effect is is almost completely abrogated here. You 
And so that's, that's this difference here in both the targeted radiated tumor as well as the unirradiated tumor. If we look at the subsets of T cells again, so again, these are gated on the antigen specific tumor specific T cells. We see an increase in the uh, number of stem like T cells in the tumor with combination therapy. If you give the drug, you completely block that increase. So what that says is that that increase is essentially entirely mediated by uh, cells coming from secondary lymphoid tissue into the tumor. And if you prevent that, you don't see that increase. And uh, that was the same thing was seen for the terminal effectors. So presumably the model is that the cells cannot get in, the stem-like cells cannot get in and cannot differentiate. So what about tumor control? Well, if you block uh, with FTY 720, you see a reduction in tumor uh, control at both the irradiated site and the unirradiated site. It's not completely abrogated, but you do see a reduction. It's probably not completely abrogated because there are still some stem-like T cells in the tumor itself. So um, that says that the lymph node is important in the synergy between radiation and TD1. Next, we really wanted to understand what effect is radiation really having on this stem-like population. As I said earlier, we know that PD-1, the main uh, kind of uh, target of anti-PD-1 is the stem-like T cell. When PD-1 is given, that cell expands, differentiates, and becomes the effector cell. Does radiation have some sort of similar effect on that T cell population? It's not an easy question to answer, but um, we answered it through a serial adoptive transfer approach. So what we did is we took cells uh, transgenic T cells, which are specific, they're called P14s, which are specific for that GP33 antigen. So we know that all of these T cells are monoclonal and specific for that antigen. And we put them into a mouse, uh, you know, at day minus one, they put a tumor on and then we analyze the cells. And what we found is similar to what other groups have shown is that in the, in the node, all of those transferred cells, so these are the non-endogenous, but the cells that were transferred in, all of them become stem-like T cells. Okay, you can see that here. It's, and in the tumor, that, that, uh, that population of naive cells, some of them are stem and some of them are differentiate. So what we did is we took, uh, we, we did this first experiment here. And then at day 14, we took those cells out of the lymph node and sorted them uh, based, on, uh, based on PD-1, CD-44, and the absence of TIM-3, a marker for effectors. So we got a pure stem-like population and then we put those into a mouse that was already had tumors on it. After those cells were in there for a few days, we then gave radiation with anti pdl one What this allowed us to do was say, what impact does combination therapy or monotherapy have on a pure uh, stem-like T cell population? And so um, <clears throat> here's the flow data and the quantitation. And these are just looking at the numbers. And what we look, what we see is that radiation alone actually increases the number of these cells in the tumor one and not quite significantly in tumor two. This experiment is, is being repeated right now, but there's a very strong trend here and it seems to be increased further with combination therapy. This, this expansion can only be driven by an expansion of that stem-like population. It's not sort of naive differentiation or anything else because we know all we put in were the stem-like T cells. If we look at the proportion of effectors and stems after the treatment, what we see is that with radiation, there's a reduction in the frequency of the stems and a trend towards an increase in the frequency of the effectors in both tumor one and tumor two. It's, uh, it's not entirely clear that this is actually uh, substantial, this differentiation here is substantially more than radiation PD-1 alone, but um, it does seem to occur. Again, this experiment is being repeated, but what we can conclude from this is that radiation does seem to promote the expansion and potentially the differentiation of stem-like T cells um, alone. It's unclear if it, it does it much better than combination therapy. So um, that's a quantitative metric. Next, we wanted to ask a qualitative assessment of what's the impact of radiation and PD-1 um, in the node on these different T cell populations, including the stem-like population. So what we did is we performed single cell RNA sequencing on uh, CD8 T cells in the tumor draining lymph node. And this is just showing untreated uh, uh, data from untreated T8 T cells in the draining lymph node of a B16F10 GP tumor bearing mouse. 
And so what we showed here in this, if you look in this kind of region, these are the, the nodal T cells. These are a tumor T, uh, T cells, and this is a naive T cell population. If you look in the nodal T cell uh, group here, there's the point I want to make is that there's, there is sort of a heterogeneity of different T cell populations on a spectrum of stemness. So some are very stem, some are less so. And that's, that's kind of shown here in the different colors and quantified here with different markers. And then you can see here the composition of the different subsets in the draining lymph node versus the tumor, the, the dark blue here representing um, sort of the, the more effectory cells, which are very prominent in the tumor and less so in the, uh, in the node. The interesting thing here is that there was this small subpopulation of T cells in the uh, kind of uh, uh, very bright green that express markers of both effector and, uh, and stem, okay? So next we looked at the training lymph node under different treatment conditions. So you, these are, the, each, all the data represents five mice in each group. So it's a total of 20 mice and you have a control pdl one alone, radiation alone, and then combination therapy. And I think what was striking here is that that very small subset seems to be dramatically overrepresented uh, with combination therapy. And that's quantified here as well as here. Um, and that was sort of a striking difference on these UMAPs here, showing that that population kind of appears out of nowhere in the combination therapy group uh, compared to the, the single treatment, which suggests that the combination therapy is, is, is stimulating a unique program in the T cells in the node that is not uh, stimulated by either PD-1 or radiation alone. And we validated the presence of that population by both flow, by flow cytometry. We also then performed pseudo time, and we show that that population appears to sort of have a different differentiation trajectory than the more traditional uh, stem to effector trajectory. Um, the implications of this we're not you know we're not we haven't fully flushed out, but it does suggest that combination therapy has a different effect on the T cell population is, is, is greater or different from the sum of its parts. So finally, uh, for the, this part of the talk, we really wanted to ask the fundamental question, are stem-like T cells actually required for the radiation stimulated abscopal effect? We have a lot of circumstantial data suggesting that they are, but we haven't actually shown that if you get rid of that population specifically, you actually attenuate the immune response. Again, a difficult question to answer. To do that, we generated a new mouse. We made a, a knock-in, a CRISPR-Cas9 knock-in of the three prime untranslated region of the TCF7 or TCF1 locus. And we knocked in a diphtheria toxin receptor into that region, which allows us to administer diphtheria toxin and specifically deplete cells that express that transcription factor. So um, we then bred these mice that we generated to the transgenic mice, the P14 T cells, and then transferred either diphtheria toxin receptor sufficient or deficient T cells into a congenically marked CD45.1 mouse. We implanted tumors and then administered diphtheria toxin in this first experiment to just prove that what we were doing was gonna work. And so here are um, data just sort of validating this approach. Here in the red, are the transferred cells from a diphtheria toxin uh, neg receptor negative mouse. Both mice got diphtheria toxin. What you can see is here in the node, this is in the drain lymph node, there is a nice stem-like population. But if you give uh, diphtheria toxin I mean, into a, if you give cells that are diphtheria toxin receptor positive and you give diphtheria toxin, it depletes the cells almost completely. Um, if you look in the tumor of these mice, uh, you're getting rid of that stem-like population very nicely uh, in the re receptor uh, positive T cells, but not in the receptor negative T cells, but you're still, uh, you still have a population of effector cells. And this is true in both tumor one and tumor two. So um, our system appears to work and, um, and we can preferentially deplete the stem-like population. So next we ask the very simple question of what effect does depleting that population have on the abscopal effect? So we, again, gave diphtheria toxin receptor uh, P14s uh, positive or negative and gave tumors and then gave radiation with PD-1 and also gave the diphtheria toxin on the schedule shown here. And we showed it that we specifically deplete the stem-like population. We can attenuate both the local control and the abscopal effect 
Now, obviously, it doesn't go to zero because there are still endogenous cells in these mice, and we're only we're only perturbing the system with the adoptive transferred population. But we show that specific depletion can attenuate the uh, local and abscopal response. Here are the flow data from these experiments. We show that in the draining lymph node, we've essentially depleted the node of cells, the transferred cells, because of course, all the cells in the node are stem-like. We also stained for that progenitor effector population, uh, which we found previously, of course, because there's no real cells there, that population is, is also depleted. If you look in the tumor of these uh, mice, here's a representative one, you can see that you're getting rid of that stem-like population and that's quantified here. So we, we are getting effective depletion of that population and we are, we are attenuating the immune response. So what do we conclude from these data? What I would say is that combination radiation PD-1, and it depends on how you give the radiation, can promote an intratumoral increase in stem-like T cells and terminal effector cells. The draining lymph node is required for this increase and that radiation can promote expansion and differentiation of the stem-like T cell population, and that this robust and, um, and an optimally robust abscopal effect depends on the stem-like T cell population. So one word I'll just say on, on these findings, which um, are preclinical and I think somewhat provocative, but are, are potentially inconsistent with some of the human data. I think a lot of the human data, at least the negative trials that have come out so far, um, are A, either given fractionated radiation over a long course with immunotherapy, which is a terrible way to do it because you're killing off any T cell that may influx in as soon as you've given the first fraction. The second thing is, um, I think for a robust abscopal response, you really need a, a um, intact uh, lymphatic network. Uh, and that's what I would argue based on these data. And a lot of the uh, metastatic trials that have been done have either irradiated sites which are intrinsically immunosuppressive, like the liver, or they're irradiating sites which do not really have a robust lymphatic network. And so the trial that we, um, we have some funding for, we're proposing is to do actually a neoadjuvant trial with radiation and PD-1, where the lymphatic network would presumably be in place and intact. And then you can really ask the question properly with a single dose of radiation, what, uh, what immunostimulatory activity does it have in that context? Okay, so the last project, um, yes, yeah. Can you, I noticed that the tumor two in your abscopal experiments is always smaller. Yes. Are you just picking the bigger tumor? No, no good question. question. So, so we actually, actually inject them sequentially uh, for, so the tumor two is smaller for a reason. One is we're, we're trying to model metachronous metastases, which is very difficult, but we inject tumor one, tumor two sequentially. The second, the second reason is because if you do not allow tumor two to be a little bit smaller, inject them sequentially, the, that, that tumor will always be the cause of death of the mouse because it has less control because you're not irradiating it. So it's a little bit of a contrivance to allow us to, to read out the system in the way we want. How many days? Typically three. Three, three days. Yeah. Um, okay, so the last, I'll talk about some of our work that we've been, that we've been uh, kind of building on that's uh, was started by a very talented resident, David Chan, who's now at uh, MD Anderson and has been continued by a great resident, uh, Dr. Patel. Um, and so this is all retrospective data that we're, and I'll just give a little primer on the clinical trial we're trying to get off the ground, um, where we have some money potentially in place, but still a lot of work to be done. And the trial design is likely going to change, actually, because um, <laughs> for a variety of issues. So in any case, the background for this, I think this, this project, and I'll try to get through it in five minutes or, or 10 minutes. Uh, this project actually was um, just a kind of started on a lark a little bit. I was just uh, sitting in the lab one day uh, in Dr. Ahmed's lab reading uh, you know, a journal article, and I came across this article by Dr. Shireman, uh, a great investigator in Switzerland, who I've subsequently met, and you know, he's, he's just the, the, the nicest person. Um, but what I, what, I, what I read was in this article was that you know, T cells, and perhaps not surprisingly, T cells have an intrinsic circadian rhythm, right? So the clock in the cell itself dictates, at least in part, where the cell will reside at a certain time of day. It's not entirely T cell driven, like epithelial cells, endothelial cells have a circadian rhythm as well. And what, it, what this does is it drives T cells into the nodes at certain times of the day and out of the nodes at other times of the day into the blood. And so what they had found was that if you vaccinate those mice uh, and induce an autoimmune disease at a specific time of day when the nodes when the nodes are sort of filled with T cells, 
you get a more robust response. Okay, the, the disease is more, uh, more severe. And there have been a lot of um, papers over the years looking at how you can modulate um, drug, deliv the drug delivery, in particular uh, immunomodulatory drugs, synchronizing it with the patient's circadian rhythm. And one of the people that have done, done a lot of this work, who gave grand rounds a, a few months back, was Dr. Levy. And you know, I, I met him after I published the paper I'll, I'll talk about, and uh, I found out that I, we had actually scooped him by a, uh, uh, a month or two. I, I felt kind of bad about that, but he was the most he was the most pleasant about it. I, I, you would ever imagine somebody that has was recently scooped. So, uh, and we built a collaboration since that time. So um, these observations were interesting to me. And so I was working on the lymph node, right? So I thought well, that's interesting. Uh, we know that the lymph node is important in the in the uh, immune response, especially to anti PD one and potentially to radiation. So um, we we know that PD one positive cells are critical for the PD one response. We know that T cells oscillate in the node. And we know the node is important. So maybe this, we can put those ideas together and perhaps when you administer immunotherapy uh, will have an impact on the stimulation of those T cells in the node. And so, you know, we don't have a mechanistic answer to that, but we performed a retrospective analysis because that's the data we had available at the time. We looked in metastatic <clears throat> melanoma patients treated at this cancer center um, from the inception of immunotherapy uh, until 2021. And so uh, this, this analysis was done in the most rigorous way and a retrospective analysis can be done by um, David Chan, a, a very talented uh, bioinformatician. And we performed a, what's called a propensity score matching analysis where we matched the patients in the early group, patients that got immunotherapy early or got a chunk of their immunotherapy early versus those that got a chunk of their immunotherapy late. And we, we matched them on, any, on all of the different metrics you would think would be important for that. And what we found is that, um, you know, patients that get a higher proportion of their immunotherapy late in the day, uh, short, live a shorter period of time, have worse progression-free survival. And then in subgroup analysis, there were certain groups that seemed to be more dependent on the time of day they received immunotherapy. So women, uh, patients with brain metastases, and then the, the receipt of dual checkpoint blockades. So dual checkpoint blockades seem to be a more important, seem to be more dependent on the time of day that it was administered than single agent. So very provocative and somewhat uh, confusing data. So what, why do we think this might be the case? Well, um, you know, I've shown this data to Mike Postow and some others. And, and you know, one idea is that, uh, you know, the, all the cycles of immunotherapy that you receive don't matter, right? You, if you respond early to immunotherapy, you're going to do well. If you do not respond early to immunotherapy, you are not going to do well. And it really depends on the first two. First, oftentimes the first infusion or the first couple of infusions. And that was shown in this uh, adapted study by uh, Mike Postow's group at Sloan Kettering. Um, so we looked at our data and we found that patients that uh, were in the early group were typically getting their first infusion early in the day. So we, we didn't, when we, when we broke it down, we broke it about the proportion of total infusions they got early in the day. But if you looked at the early group, most of those patients were getting their initial infusions early in the day. And so that was a potential driver of the effect we were seeing. And then, um, and we also looked at response rate. And although it was not significant, patients that got their immunotherapy early in the day also had a better response rate. And that's a little bit harder to confound with other socioeconomic factors. We, um, the, Francis, this group then published a paper looking at non-small cell lung cancer and found very similar findings. And this was out of France, uh, where early in the day uh, was better, <clears throat> what patients had better PFS and OS. And then very nice work more recently that was in abstract form at CITSI uh, last year, and then is in, uh, is in under revision at JITSI right now um, uh, in renal cell carcinoma, uh, Jimmy Patel has shown that if you give uh, immunotherapy late in the day, that also is associated with worse overall survival. So one question we get a lot is, you know, uh, there's a long, a relatively long half-life of, of checkpoint uh, drugs. So why does it matter what time of day you get it? Well, I think, you know, if we give the first, in, if we're just talking about the first infusion, that does not reach steady state, um, you know, it does not reach steady state levels in the blood and actually falls up, falls off enough that um, during one circadian cycle, that that, uh, that could 
that could be responsible for the effect seen. Additionally, it could be that the distribution to the tissues we're looking at don't aren't reflected by serum concentrations, right? So the node we think is important may have much more rapid clearance than than the blood. So still retrospective, still we just all we can do is wave our hands and argue. We can't really make a mechanistic or conclusive uh, convincing argument until we've done a uh, randomized controlled trial. So the original incarnation of this trial was to do it in the metastatic setting. We presented it to NCI and we got feedback that we should move it to the neoadjuvant setting. We're having some issues with that, so we may move it back to the net metastatic setting, but regardless, I'll prevent the neoadjuvant approach that we've discussed. Uh, the neoadjuvant approach allows us to get a lot of interesting immune correlates, and so that's, the, that's part of the reason we had moved to this setting. Uh, the clinical trial that we have, um, we're, we're sort of moving forward was looking at uh, resectable melanoma patients, standard enrollment criteria for um, the, the main neoadjuvant trials in melanoma. And we would randomize patients to blocks of time, um, two, two hour blocks throughout the day, um, and give them ipinevo, flip dose ipinevo, two doses, and then they would go to surgery. The primary endpoint would have been pathologic response um, as a continuous variable. And these blocks of time were selected because actually statistically, when you model a circadian cycle, you actually get increased power more for more time blocks than more patients per time block. So um, I'm happy to discuss the rationale behind that uh, afterwards. But with that, I'd just like to um, acknowledge, you know, a lot of people that have helped with these work. Uh, the first part should hopefully be published in the next few months. The second stuff is being submitted soon. We have to repeat a couple of experiments I mentioned. And then the third is published or will be published soon. So David Chen and Jimmy Patel for the third part. Mike Lowe has been instrumental in helping build uh, the clinical trial and move it forward. For the first part, uh, Dr. Hopkins, a resident as well, has helped with some of the coding for for the um, the human stuff. And of course, there are innumerable people here that um, I could thank individually. And here are folks in my lab. Yang Shen has done the project, a second project in Qingjing was very helpful, as well as Prasanthi for the first project. And of course, Carrie Jansen is the lead author of the uh, the first paper and done in close collaboration with the Kissick Lab. So, and then, of course, neurosurgery I could not do without them. And I'll stop there and take questions. Just gonna uh, thank Dr. Buckle for an excellent lecture. Um, before, if you have any questions, please use the Q and A feature on the bottom of the screen if you're attending virtually, and then we'll take questions in person here as well. Uh, while I, we wait on questions, I um, need to mention that next week there are no grand rounds. We will resume after Thanksgiving on November 29th with Colin Weeks from Harvard University presenting on harnessing tumor heterogeneity for therapeutic intent. To view all upcoming Winship Grand Rounds lectures, please visit the Grand Rounds page on the Winter on the Winship uh, website. So, um, questions for Dr. Buckwald? Okay, I'll run to another Zoom that starts at 8:30. But just a comment, I think, about the clinical trials. Very interesting and very exciting. One thing you might want to measure in those papers <laughs> is the content of CD34 positive cells in the blood over time, because that also is regulated by circadian rhythm work we've published with our shed Kayumi. And it, you probably can see the fluctuation of CD34 positive cells more easily than the fluctuation of T cells, because there are so many T cells, minor changes and egress from lymph nodes are gonna be hard to measure. But the 34 positive cells really go up and down, so it would be validation that the circadian rhythm is present. Probably doesn't have anything to do with immunotherapy, but it yeah. it yeah. ties your data to the circadian yeah. rhythm. That's a, that's that's a great, great suggestion. suggestion. Great. Thank you. Yeah, Zach, great talk. Do you have enough uh, dose dose heterogeneity in your ongoing trial to, to look for a dose response, or or is it all effectively just one dose? At this point? Uh, are you talking about the uh, the, the uh, yeah. The, well, the, the ongoing one you have right now, right? Well, we, the, uh, the, the brain, brain trial. trial. Yeah. yeah, the brain. So good, good question. So um, it is not all, unfortunately, it's not all effectively one dose. I couldn't, I, that would be better for our analysis, but it wasn't entirely ethical based on the, the sizes of the tumor. So there is some heterogeneity. It, it, the, 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 size, the number of patients on the trial were about 25. So we can do sort of a subgroup analysis, but we can't get any statistics based on, on dose from that. Yeah, Andreas. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, great. Great talk, Zach. Um, just a quick question about the the CRISPR um, 
uh, depletion of uh, your stem-like cells. So when you deplete the stem-like cells, do you see changes in the number of uh, effector cells afterwards? Yeah. Or effector in the P14? Yeah, so good question. And I, I, a little, I glossed over that a little bit. So there is, um, so you get rid of all the stems. There is some reduction in the effector cells just because, you know, you're, you're, the, the popul presumably the population of stems, which is maintaining the effectors is also reduced. So that is a potential criticism. You could say, well, you're reducing the effector numbers, but, um, but there's no way to really kind of account for that, unfortunately. So, but your point is fair. Yes, you do see some reduction in the effector numbers. They're still there, but they're a little bit down. Well, that was interesting, your clonality experiment um, and how really the dominant clone seems to take over yes. with radiation. Yes. So a checkpoint, it seems like checkpoint, in, at least in neoadjuvant studies, seems to promote proliferation of the subdominant clones. Mm. So do you think that could be part of the synergy between those two agents and that you haven't looked at and maybe want to? Or? That's That's a, a, um, so, so, okay, so, so I, I can, can tell you what, what we've seen in our more extensive analysis we have seen um so i think it could it could be both i that what i showed you there was really focused on the immunodominant clone because that's typically the most numerous mm -hmm. i think we do i do think you if we, we can look more carefully we do see an expansion of of subdominant clones as well so i'm not sure that doesn't occur um but as far as the the expansion of that or I can't really argue expansion because it could be that we're depleting other things out and you're just seeing, but I do think it is expansion based on the preclinical data. So I think that that clone is already overrepresented and it's just like GP33 is the immunodominant clone and we see an expansion. I think something yeah. similar is happening in the brain. I just, it's very hard to argue that convincingly in a human. So, yeah. All right. Oh, yes, Dr. Um, uh, lots of cells, I would think, are on a circadian uh, rhythm <laughs> that are also sensitive to radiation, like T cells and macrophages, potentially. And I, I don't know how widely you can expand this trial uh, looking at different things, but. Uh, well, well, definitely. definitely uh, so, so, first, first of all, all I, yes, I completely. I think everything is on a I think a circadian biologist would argue essentially everything is on a circadian rhythm. rhythm. Uh, I, I will definitely, definitely, I mean, we're, we're, if you're in a metastatic setting, we'll certainly get blood, serial blood, over an extended period of time. And we, we would do, we would pretty uh, broad, we would try to as broadly as we can look at different cell types. But it's a, I don't want to miss something, but, you know, it's, it's a good point. So, I mean, one suggestion from Francis Levy sort of when I was at this conference was to like measure like the, like the what's, what's called, called the prototype, prototype of the patient, like, like have them wear something. So people, people get up at different times, times like that. So you can actually account for that. that. I, I mean, I would love to do that, that but I'm having a hard time getting the trial off the ground. So yeah. <laughs> I got to pick and choose what I do. So yeah. Oh yeah, thank you for saying that. Oh, we're almost out of time, I know, but oh no, no, no questions. All right, thanks everybody for joining. I appreciate it. Thank you for the, 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 the OR. Thanks for coming. <laughs>